Good morning, beautiful Savior. Happy fall. Happy November. Happy pre-pre-Christmas. This is such a cool time of year. We got so much to be thankful for, right? So much to thank our God for. And as we're in the month of November, getting ready for Thanksgiving, what better topic than to talk about some of the reasons we have to be thankful. And as I was praying through this series, as I was trying to figure out what, what foundation do we want to build from? Where do we want to start? 1 Thessalonians 5.18 just ties everything together so perfectly. Take a look. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Be thankful in all circumstances. It's not really groundbreaking information. I am sure all of you are, are thinking, yeah, all right, I should be thankful. God gives me a lot of stuff. That's so true, and yet in our world, it's so easily forgotten. You know, it's easy in church to say, yeah, God, I'm thankful for it all, thanks. But if we had a hidden camera follow you around all the time, I, I bet you're not living as thankfully as, uh, as maybe you think. And you have good reason to. Our world and our culture, I mean, in light of everything that's going on around us, it's easy to forget to be thankful. We've just been walking through one of the, the tightest, most voted in, uh, whatever you want to call it, one of the most brutal elections ever, all right? And, and it's ugly. It's, it's been ugly. It's probably going to continue to get ugly, but this election can be distracting. You've got coronavirus, okay? You've got friends and family being impacted by this, people who've died from it, people who are struggling in the hospital from it, people who aren't sure if they have it and are terrified if they're going to give it to someone else. That's distracting, all right? You've got all this division in our country, people just fighting, whether it's politics or coronavirus or whatever it is. There's division. There's struggle. Have you really been thankful in all circumstances? I really haven't. I've heard the phrase, um, it's easy to miss the forest for the trees. But I think the opposite is true as well. It's easy to miss the trees for the forest. Our world can be distracting, but God's blessings, they never cease. Sometimes we just miss them, you know? We miss the blessing, we miss the work, and we fail to be thankful. But today is a perfect kickoff day as we start our new series and as we begin to shed light on things to be thankful for as today we celebrate and honor our veterans. Because Veterans Day is this week Wednesday. If you didn't know, mark your calendars. It is this week Wednesday. Say thank you to a veteran. And to all of you who are sitting in our worship center right now or if you're tuning in virtually from at home, to all of you who have served in every branch of the military from the bottom of my heart and from all of us at Beautiful Savior, thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for our freedom. These men and women, regardless of how you feel about war or, or any of that, they're heroes because they've sacrificed their time. They've sacrificed their, their, their families. They've sacrificed their, their livelihoods, some of them even their lives, all to serve us and to give us freedom. By serving this country, these men and women have served you and they've served me. They've given us more than, than we ever deserved, probably more than we ever asked for. And they did it all because they knew it was right. They felt a calling on their life to jump in. And so again, I just, I want to say thank you to all of you. You're an inspiration. And the truth of the matter is, it's the veteran, not the reporter, who gave us freedom of the press. It's the veteran, not the poet, who gave us the freedom of speech. It's the veteran, not the campus organizer, who gave us the freedom to assemble. It's the veteran, not the politician, who gave us the right to vote. It's the veteran, not the pastor, who gave us the freedom of religion. We get to meet today, some of us in person, some of us virtually. We get to praise our God however we want. We get to lift it all to Him. We get to talk about it in public. Maybe not in public schools, but we get to talk about it in public. All because of our veterans. So thank you. Thank you for what you've given to us. And as we use the term veteran today, it's got a very specific meaning, right? A veteran in light of today, is someone who has served in the military. 
It's as simple as that. And any of you out there who have had any desire to maybe jump into the military here or there to join up, I'm sure you could talk to one of our veterans that are here and they'd be more than happy to share with you some of their experiences, some advice. I bet they'd even have an opinion on which branch of the military you should join. They probably have some good thoughts on uh, how to physically prepare yourself for boot camp. Maybe how to mentally prepare yourself. How to maybe stay a little bit in the shadows instead of you know being up front and being the one that the drill sergeants are going to pick on. Maybe even to give you a little bit of information on what to expect. And in our reading today, we're seeing a lot of the same sort of advice being given from a veteran in the army of God. Because the Apostle Paul has fought many battles before this letter is written. He has done many tours all in service of Jesus Christ. He no doubt has scars from his fight. He's been beaten, whipped, chained, imprisoned, even stoned throughout his years of service. Paul was a veteran, but his service gives us a slightly different definition to the term. And in Paul's case, a veteran is someone who has had long experience in a particular field. Paul proclaimed the good news of Jesus for over 30 years. All right? And before, before that, you know, he was kind of a jerk. But then for 30 years, God used him to do incredible things, to to be in his army until he was martyred by Nero, the Roman emperor of the time. He was a veteran in the army of God. And as he was writing this letter, as he was nearing the end of his life, all he wanted was to be sure he passed along some, some of his experiences and some advice to a new young recruit, to Timothy to a guy who was enlisting and preparing for his own battles as he served in the army of God. And some of you that are young soldiers in the army of God, maybe you're a new Christian, you're a new believer, maybe you're just young, you know? There are some old veterans from the army of God here today, and I'm sure they would love to pass along some of the advice, some of the experience that they've had, some of the stories in their lives, some of the good times, some of the bad times. No matter what it is, I'm sure they'd be willing to share that with you because it's, it's a lifestyle to serve God, to serve in the army of God. It's hard, but I bet none of our veterans would change it for anything. Paul was the same way. He wanted to share those good times. He wanted to share those bad times, those impending doom moments all so that Timothy would have as much as he possibly could to serve in the best way possible. Let's take another look at the first four verses of our reading today. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And the reason we're zeroing in on these four verses today is because Paul is giving Timothy and us four truths, four bits of advice to help us as we serve in the army of God. First off, Paul is telling Timothy to be strong, not physically strong. All right, in the U.S. military, it's, it's kind of a requirement. You got to be strong. You got to be able to do stuff. But it's not necessary in the army of God. Paul's also not telling Timothy that he needs to be academically strong. All right, in order to rise through the ranks of our military branches, you got to be smart. You know, you got to be able to figure things out. You got to be able to plan. You got to be, you know, a part of it mentally. For a while in high school, I was looking at going to the Naval Academy. You know, I visited Annapolis, I watched the movies, I did research, I looked into what I could do because I wanted to be a Marine. I thought that was so cool. The academic side of that is pretty intense, right? There's a lot of stuff you got to know. There's a lot of stuff you got to figure out. And obviously the military has figured out how to train their people in an effective way to pull off what they need to do. But at the same time, that can be daunting. But that's not a requirement in the army of God. You don't have to know every word of scripture. You don't have to know the ins and outs of the the genus myostaticum or any of these Latin phrases or whatever we're going on. What you need to know, what you need to be strong in, is the grace that is received in Christ Jesus. 
That's what Paul is telling Timothy. It's not about what you know. It's not about what you can gain. It's about what you have been given through the work of Christ Jesus. And what is that grace? We just talked about it for weeks on weeks on weeks. Okay, it is the unmerited, the undeserved favor of God. God's riches at Christ's expense. We sing about how amazing grace really is, how sweet, how incredible, how awesome it is. And this grace, it's with us through everything we experience. Through every battle we face, God's grace is there. Through every trial that comes along, God's grace is there. Through every temptation that crosses our path, God's grace is there. God's grace always has been, always is, and always will be with us. It's backing us up. It's supporting us. It's covering our movements and it's filling us with confidence. A soldier needs the backing of the entity that they serve, right? Needs the the support of their government. Needs their team to cover them as they're, they're moving, as they're pulling off maneuvers. And need to have the confidence of knowing they're going to succeed in their mission. That's what God's grace is for us. It backs us up when we struggle, you know? It supports us when we fall. It covers us when we sin. And it gives us hope in our future. We have God's grace. And where does it come from? Just like Paul told Timothy, just like I told you just a couple minutes ago, grace is found in Christ alone. That's where we find the strength that we need, this grace that we need. There's no other source. It doesn't come from positive thinking. It doesn't come from being a good person. It doesn't come from karma. It comes from Christ alone. And you may think I'm beating a bit of a dead horse here. We just spent, again, weeks on weeks and weeks talking about how it's in Christ alone, through faith alone, with grace alone, and all these sort of alones. But look at the world we're in right now. Look at what's going on around us. So much of it is just screaming at you, pushing you to to think, find the strength inside of yourself. You know, dig deep, get better, try harder. Guys, I got news for you. It's not in you. This strength that Paul is talking about for Timothy, it's not in you. You can't find it in you. The only place that it comes from It's through Christ alone. You can't dig deep enough. You can't try hard enough. You can't work out hard enough. You can't be good enough. Because this strength comes from outside of you, and yet it still becomes a part of you. It comes from the grace received in Christ alone. So be strong by the grace that is given to you in Christ Jesus. Next, our resident veteran Paul tells Timothy to pass it on. Take a look, verse 2. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. When you read through the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, you can see all the advice, the information, the teaching, but most importantly, you see the love that Paul had for Timothy. Even in this letter here, he calls Timothy his son because what what it is very apparent in the letters is that Paul had such a close relationship with Timothy. He loved the man like a son. And I bet all Paul wanted was to one day be able to sit on those golden roads of heaven and just talk with Timothy. And maybe that's what they're doing right now. Maybe that's how they're hanging out with God. They're just talking about the awesome ways that God blessed them. But here in this moment in verse two, what Paul wants to do is Paul wants to pass along everything that he has acquired through the amazing revelation of God. He wants to share with Timothy, here's everything that I've ever experienced ever. Here's the awesome love that God has for you. Here's the grace that God has given to you. Here's the mercy that God shows to you. All of this is true. And then he wants Timothy to pass it on to others, who would then pass it on to others, who would then pass it on to others, who would eventually pass it on to us. And now we have been called to pass it on to those who go after us. And if you think about our world today, that's so true. That's, that's how we operate. That's how we live. I, I can still remember conversations I had with my mom, a veteran in the army of God, how she helped me to understand the grace and the love of God. Maybe it didn't take immediately, but that seed was planted and has now burst forth. 
For some of you, as you look around the worship center right now, maybe you look around the room that you're in, you see some veterans in the army of God who've passed along that grace of Jesus to you. Teachers, DCEs, people who have been trained, who are just on fire for Jesus. They're veterans in the army of God, passing along the grace that God gave to them. They can't help it. And then we have those great saints who have gone home before us, those veterans in the army whose work is done whose service is over, and who are now experiencing that grace they've passed on to us fully, sitting on that golden road with Paul and Timothy. They may not have been the strongest. They may not have been the most educated. But they had the grace of God, and they passed it on to us. Have you passed it on? Have you shared the grace that Jesus first passed to you? I'm not very old. All right, I'm 29 years old. I may have 90 years left in my life. I may have 90 seconds left in my life. But no matter what it is, my goal in this life, what I desire to do, what God has placed on my heart is to pass on the grace and love and peace and mercy of Jesus that I know to be true. My goal is to pass on the hope of salvation that fills my soul and to share the love of God who forgave me, a lost and condemned person with as many people as possible. I am not the strongest. I am not the smartest. But I'm gonna do everything I can through Christ who strengthens me to make sure that I'm passing that on to as many people as possible. That I'm passing it on to little baby Charlie Rose so that she can pass it on to her children. And that journey of passing it on, we've said it before, we'll say it again. There are some great times. There are some bad times. There are some downright nasty times. But we push on towards the prize. We push on towards the goal. And that's Paul's next bit of advice. Take a look at verse 3. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Paul, a veteran in the army of God, His next bit of advice is to endure. You see, nobody said it would be easy, all right? Have you all ever heard the verse, God will never give you more than you can handle? I have to believe most, if not everybody has. Um, Unfortunately, that's not actually in scripture, at least not in the way we take it. That is actually a misquote of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Take a look. No temptation has seized you that isn't common for people. But God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond your abilities. Instead, with the temptation, God will also supply a way out so that you will be able to endure it. What this says is God will never allow you to be tempted more than you can handle. You will never be allowed to enter into a situation where sin is your only option. There's always a way for you to turn away from sin. So does that mean you're going to face struggle and hardship beyond what you can handle? Yes. Yes, it does. And that may be so crushing to hear, but at the same time, remember, in our weakness, God's power is glorified. Where we fail is where God gets to show us you don't have to succeed. Because again, it's not about what we can do. It's not about our inner strength. It's not about how much we can handle and how great we are for that. It's about the gift of God that is given to us so that none of us can boast. All we're called to do is to endure. Serving in the army of God, it's not about being self-sufficient. It's not about finding that inner strength in you. It's about putting our trust in the one who is actually capable of enacting a solution, of executing the mission perfectly. It's about us enduring through the pain, through the suffering, through the loss, and trusting in our God. Going back to our military veterans, I have to be, well, I bet you've got some pretty rough stories, some pretty awful moments from your time serving in the U.S. military. If you just Google it, some U.S. military veterans had to go days without food or water. Some were captured. Some were tortured. Some faced hand-to-hand combat. Some are forever wounded 
because of the willing sacrifice that they had in order to serve their country. But through all of it, they endured. Through all of it, they overcame what they needed to in order to come home. And by coming home, they won. They were victorious. We, as soldiers of the cross, we may be called upon to endure some pretty horrific, awful days. In fact, it's, it's probably not an if, it's, it's a when. Those who came before us have experienced it and they can share it. And if you go back into scripture, Jesus even really kind of started his ministry by helping the disciples see, by following me, there is a target on your back. You are going to have to endure because junk is coming your way. Take a look at uh, his warning for them in chapter 5 of Matthew. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a reward waits, awaits you in heaven. And remember the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. This is not a if you're persecuted. This is a when you're persecuted. But at the same time, Jesus, in giving this warning to the disciples, is also sharing with them a reward awaits. Hope awaits. Salvation awaits. And the disciples, for us, those are Jesus' first closest followers. They're prime examples of the persecution that that we could experience. And they experienced a much more extreme version than we do today. Right? For us here in the United States, you're probably not facing death for following Jesus. All right? Maybe you face a little bit of ridicule. Maybe you face more of, of verse 11 there. All right? When people lie about you, they say mean things about you. Okay? That's more the persecution we experience. But for the disciples, the disciples, for the most part, experienced brutal persecutions and even more brutal deaths. And yet they didn't waver in their service to the king. Only one disciple was not murdered. He was exiled for the rest of his life to the island of Patmos. That was John, the disciple that Jesus loved. But as we fast forward to today, the closest thing we have to people facing that sort of persecution would be our missionaries. Our missionaries in some areas are literally putting their lives on the line in order to pass on the grace of Jesus. But they're enduring. They're overcoming, and in the end, y'all, they will be victorious by the strength found in the grace we receive in Christ Jesus. Have y'all ever heard of uh, Joseph, Joseph Scriven? He was a missionary back in the 19th century. He was from Ireland, and he was a missionary to the Iroquois people in Canada. And his fiance came along with him, and as they were doing their awesome things, passing on the grace of Jesus to everyone around them, Right before their wedding, his wife died in an ice accident. He was crushed. He buried her with his own hands and was just destroyed. But a year later, suffering that hardship, suffering that loss, suffering that that rough, terrible, horrific day, a year later, he wrote a letter to his mother and just wrote down some of his reflections on the incredible power of God. Take a look. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In the face of loss, of heartbreak, of suffering, Joe endured. By the grace of God, Joe overcame. And today, Joe is reunited with his fiance, probably sitting on those same golden streets, talking it up with Paul and Timothy. Joe is victorious. We endure and we continue to run towards the prize. So to be in the army of God, Paul has told Timothy and us, you gotta be strong, all right? You gotta pass it on. You gotta endure. And finally, you gotta stay focused. Take a look, verse four. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life for they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. Our old veteran of the cross gives Timothy one more bit of advice. Stay focused, 
Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep them straight ahead. Keep focused on what Jesus has called you to do. Don't let things distract you. And this is not the first time Paul said something like this. He said it to the Philippians. Take a look. Chapter 3. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. I think that most of us have probably heard verse 14 before. Paul presses on toward the calling he has in Christ Jesus. He keeps his eye on the prize, his eye on the goal. He doesn't let things, or at least he tries, not to let things outside of himself distract him. He stays focused. This is a great verse. But the next three are just as great. Verse 15, let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Dear brother and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. This is some of the absolute best advice Paul is not only given to Timothy, but to the Philippians, to us, to everybody. All right? Don't let disagreements divide you. Paul is our resident veteran. He's seen it happen. And this is by far some of the greatest advice he's ever given. Just like all those veterans out there today who we're celebrating today, who gave their lives in service, gave their lives in service, not not to die, but to serve the United States. They had to be on guard in order to make sure they were focused on their duty, they were focused on their responsibility, and not get distracted by the things around them. It could have cost them their lives. We as Christians also need to be on guard because Satan is coming after us and trying to distract us from from so many different things in our world. And Satan will use big things and little things. All right, right now, what's Satan using? You got to guess? I got to think you probably do, okay? What's been happening this past week? This election, distraction. All right, the coronavirus, distraction. The division in our country, distraction. All of this is just Satan trying to distract us from the goal, the job, the duty that we've been given, the calling that Christ has given to us to share his name with everyone we can. But then Satan also uses the little things. You know, what color should we paint the walls? How how long should a service be? You know, what what font should we use? All right, all of these sort of things that, that seem so important in the moment we get so passionate about. Is Satan distracting us from our duty? No matter what it is, good things or bad things, Satan uses it all. His goal never changes. He wants to distract you from passing on everything that's going on. Stay focused on the goal. Stay focused on the prize. Stay focused on the hope of salvation that can only be found in Christ Jesus. So to recap, Paul is telling Timothy and us, be strong in the grace that is only found in Christ Jesus. Pass on the message of the gospel to everyone you can. Endure the hardships of this world and stay focused on the prize. All of this comes together in order to please the officer who enlisted us in this this army. And you may wonder, who, who is that officer? You know, is that my mom? Is that my friend? Is that my pastor? Is that this person who told me about Jesus? It actually all comes down to one being, the supreme creator of the universe, the commander-in-chief of all of creation, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are the ones who have enlisted us into the army of God. And our duty summed up for us in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Take a look, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. Then in the New Testament, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, or passing it on, to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As you sit here today, as you sit in our worship center, as you sit at home, as you sit wherever you are seeing this message and hearing it today, you have been called into the army of God. 
It is your duty to obey the commander, to act on his orders, to go and make disciples of all nations. And this is not in order to earn your place in the conversation with Paul and Timothy on those golden streets of heaven, but because you have already been saved by the grace of Christ Jesus our Lord and assured of your place in paradise. So to close, I want you to just take these questions with you. Are you strong in the grace that is found in Christ? Are you passing on the gospel to those around you? Are you enduring hardships and pushing on to the goal? Are you staying focused on your duty to go and make disciples? Are you pleasing the one who's enlisted you? Amen. Thank you.